So I'd first like to begin by explaining to you all how this project got started. It was a long time in the making. Um, most of my life as an academic and as an activist revolved around the black freedom movement, revolved around civil rights issues. That's what I planned on studying in college, in many ways I did, going to graduate school for. And as a young kid and a young student, nuclear weapons wasn't on my radar. Uh, like a lot of kids, it was in the abstract. I was fighting for, against police brutality and abject poverty, and I was thinking nobody's going to be crazy enough to use them, so it was out of my realm. But in 2005, as a student, is when I made my first trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And when I went there and met with atomic bomb survivors and saw what my country had done, I was filled with such rage and guilt and anger that I couldn't ignore it. And so I came back and I said to my advisor at the time, I need to find a way to combine these two passions of mine, eliminating racism and eliminating nuclear weapons. And he said, well, answer me one question. What did African Americans think about dropping the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And starting to find the answer to that question is the thing that led me down this path and ultimately to this book and all of this work. And when I pitched this idea, to a lot of colleagues and friends, they said, you're not gonna find anything. They said African Americans were too busy trying to gain their own freedom and equality here, understandably so, they couldn't possibly care about this issue. But they were wrong. In June of 1964, a group of Hiroshima survivors, atomic bomb survivors, came here on a world peace study mission. The woman that organized their meeting was the great Yuri Kachiyama, the amazing Japanese-American activist who we lost not too long ago. And she asked them, while you're here in the United States, what is it that you want to do most? And they all said the same thing, meet Malcolm X. But Malcolm at the time was traveling through the Middle East and through Africa, and she was friends with him, of course, and was writing him letters, but didn't think any of them actually got to him. And the last day when the survivors were in her apartment in Harlem, there was a knock at the door. And she answered the door and there stood Malcolm. And he spent the day with the atomic bomb survivors and said, the bomb that hit you was the atomic bomb, but the bomb that hit us was racism. And he explained how the Vietnam War and colonialism and nuclear weapons and race were all interconnected. Because he understood what so many before him understood, that the issue wasn't about civil rights. It was universal human rights. So my book and my research looks at those African-American activists who consistently argued that the fight for racial equality in the United States was inextricably linked to nuclear disarmament and liberation movements around the world. Now, when we dropped the bomb on August 6, 1945, and three days later on Nagasaki, the majority of the American public rejoiced and celebrated the decision. In fact, Gallup ran a poll a week after the atomic bombings in which 85% of the American public agreed with Truman's decision to use nuclear weapons. A Roper poll was held a week later in which 22% of the American public wished that Japan hadn't surrendered so he could have dropped more nuclear weapons and killed more people. And in fact, no poll up until late October of 1945 ever showed more than 4.5% of the American public criticizing Truman's decision. And that's because in this country, we had a genocidal race hatred against the people of Japan that is unparalleled in our nation's history. Even worse than the racism that we saw towards people of Middle Eastern descent after 9-11. If you look at the images of the Japanese during that time, during World War II after Pearl Harbor, they were of cockroaches and mice and vermin and yellow monkeys. And why? Because if you reduce a people to being something less than human and an other, it is easier to commit violence against them. You're not dropping bombs on mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and human beings. And this is not new. We, of course, did this in Vietnam. We, of course, did this with slavery. If you are going to take millions of people and kidnap them from Africa and for hundreds of years, beat them and rape them and castrate them and burn them alive and do all of this torture and genocide, you can't do it if they're human beings. So we create another. We create something less than human. So this is not new. The motto of the Marines at the time was, remember Pearl Harbor, keep them dying. General Joseph Stilwell wrote to his wife, quote, when I think of how these bow-legged cockroaches have ruined our calm lives, it makes me want to wrap jab guts around every lamppost in Asia. And we don't do this with the other countries during World War II. 
We're very careful in our literature to separate Nazis from Germans, fascists from Italians, but not Japan. Everyone was guilty for what happened with Pearl Harbor. But this wasn't the case in the black community. And of course, nothing's monolithic. Not everybody thought the same. But there was an affinity for the Japanese that was already built in in the black community before the bomb was ever dropped. Many forget that when Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935 and the U.S. did nothing, it was the Japanese who publicly came out and said they were going to come to the defense of their colored brothers and sisters in Ethiopia. W.E.B. Du Bois had already traveled through Asia and was lionized in Japan, wrote about it in the Chicago Defender. When Japanese internment happened, there were many in the black community that saw people being put in prisons and concentration camps for no crime they committed, but simply because of the color of their skin and said, this could happen to us, are we going to be next? And started sneaking in food and clothes into the internment camps. And so, before there was any major anti-nuclear movement, activists and artists and musicians and journalists and pastors and ordinary folks in the black community came out against Truman in the decision to use nuclear weapons. The atomic veterans, of course, were some of the initial protesters and activists as well as those in the religious community. And so when I first, first started doing this research, I immediately went to the black press. Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American. This is where so many in the African-American community got their news from. And I saw overwhelmingly a pattern with columnists criticizing Truman's decision and critical of nuclear weapons. But I wanted to know what ordinary folks thought. So I started going through letters to the editor. Now when I speak to classes and college students today and I talk about searching this, you all have the luxury now of ProQuest. So you get to just go into a database, cup a few, put in a few, few keystrokes, hit search, and it's all there for you. I was in the Library of Congress on microfilm going through issue by issue looking at every single letter. And what I found, whether it was beauty shop owners or truck drivers or domestic workers, I found the same thing. I found the same pattern of being critical and scared of nuclear weapons. I started looking at pastors, black pastors in churches, their sermons right after the atomic bombing. And I found another pattern, a very apocalyptic narrative, that the genie was let out of the bottle and do we have enough religion to stop this racism and the rise of nuclear weapons. And one of the first to come out and question Truman's racism in this decision was Langston Hughes. And he was certainly right to do so. Truman's not the most racist president. We perhaps have that now, but certainly was one of the most racist presidents in U.S. history. If you go through Truman's letters to his wife, Bess, he rarely ever refers to African Americans as anything other than the N-word. This is a man whose mother openly supported the Confederacy and when she visited him at the White House said she'd rather sleep on the floor than ever step foot in Lincoln's bedroom. He brags in interviews that when you got married in his family's history, you got slaves as wedding presents to start out the housekeeping with. He sent a $10 check to the Ku Klux Klan to join, but they sent it back to him because he refused to fire Catholic workers in one of the jobs and businesses he was running in Missouri. And when he is told that we just dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, killing hundreds of thousands of people instantly, the first thing he did was jump up in the air and say, quote, this is the greatest thing in history. I found a, these are the things, of course, that you won't find in a David McCullough books in the bad Gary Sinise films. This isn't in the historical narrative when we talk about Harry Truman. I found a letter that Zora Neale Hurston wrote to Claude Barnett in which she refers to Truman as, quote, the butcher of Asia and is visibly upset that more in the black community are not doing something to stop this madness. But in the initial protests, the most came from what's known as the Black Popular Front, the Council on African Affairs, the National Negro Congress, and most notably W.E.B. Du Bois and the great Paul Robeson. Du Bois said that what we did in Japan was going to, quote, set back the progress of colored nations for decades to come, and likened Truman to Hitler. Paul Robeson, who it's just so tragic that so many of my students have never heard his name, this amazing individual. I'm so glad that Steve McQueen, the director of 12 Years a Slave, has signed on to do a biopic of him so students will finally get to discover who he, who, who he was. In, January of in June of 1946, there was a rally at Madison Square Garden. 20,000 people there. And at that rally, Paul Robeson immediately discusses the colonialism issue asking the question, where is the United States getting the uranium to build nuclear weapons? 
And the answer, of course, was the Belgian-controlled Congo. But so much of this vocal criticism stops in the late 1940s and early 50s because of the Truman Doctrine. Long before George W. Bush ever said, with us or against us, it was Truman who put that line in the sand. And so one of the worst labels you could get in this country at that time was to be black and red. McCarthyism and HUAC swept this nation. And so a lot of these groups fell mute. There was too much of a price to pay. Some tried to bargain. The NAACP on this particular issue took a sharp turn to the right. They thought that if they became far anti-communist, even going against their own leader in Du Bois, that somehow this would result in civil rights. It doesn't happen. But not everybody thought that peace was a bargaining chip. Because at the same time in the early 1950s, you had what's known as the Ban the Bomb Pledge. Coming out of Stockholm and communist bloc nations, there was a Ban the Bomb petition that W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and others ran with and brought it to the United States. Now, again, when I tell young students today about a petition to ban nuclear weapons, big deal. Because we can all be armchair activists. We can all go on our phones and go to change.org and we're one click away from saying we signed the petition. But that wasn't the case for these people. They targeted the black community. People like Marianne Anderson and Charlie Parker were signing this. And there were real consequences for putting your name on this petition to ban nuclear weapons. People lost their jobs, were physically accosted, went to jail. Government brought up charges for W.E.B. Du Bois as being an agent to the Soviet Union, found not guilty, of course. Millions of people, though, signed this petition in the United States. 60 million signed it worldwide. And so when you look at, here we are, right before the civil rights movement, the dawn of it, and here you have so many in the black community risking their lives, their careers, to fight against nuclear weapons because they saw the breakout of the Korean War. And they said, we're not going to allow another Hiroshima to happen. Not on another people of color, because we had threatened multiple times to use nuclear weapons in Korea. They saw the arms race happening. And we developed the bomb in 45, the Russians get it in 49, but we get the hydrogen bomb in 52, they get it in 53, and now it's fully on. And they said, it's not going to happen on our watch. So it's extraordinary to see them doing this when there's all these issues in the early 50s facing them in terms of civil rights. And in the mid-1950s, when we look at when the civil rights movement really came into play, we largely look at 1955, pivotal year. In the summer of 1955, you have the heinous murder of Emmett Till. A few months later in December, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But what many people forget is, in that same year, you had what is known as the Bandung Conference, the first all-Asian African conference in the world. 27 nations coming together. And if you look at the Bandung Conference and what they were fighting for and why they were meeting, it was to fight white supremacy, to fight colonialism, and to fight for nuclear disarmament. And all of this was leading to what's known as the Sahara Project. Coming into the late 1950s, the French government wanted to be a world power, and they wanted to test their first nuclear weapon. And where did they decide to test it? In the Sahara. And so at the time, you had the Algerian Revolution happening. You had Kwame Nkrumah rising up in Ghana, getting their independence. And the people in Ghana feared that this nuclear test, what the fallout would do to their cocoa industry. And so the individual that took a look at all this and said, here we are fighting for equality in the United States. And here you have the, the, the French testing a nuclear weapon in Africa. Here you have independence movements, how this is all related. It was his dad mentioned, Byron Rustin. Again, somebody so forgotten. So forgotten in our history. Why? Because he was gay. Here's the organizer that dates all the way back to the 1930s, this, this body of work of his. Wouldn't have had a march on Washington without Byron Rustin. But yet so many of my students, again, have never heard his name. And so Rustin, working with British activists and African activists, put a team together to go to Africa to stop this test. And not everybody wanted him to do that. A. Philip Randolph and other civil rights leaders were writing to him saying, come back to the United States. We're working on the primaries. We're working on protesting Kennedy. And, and he was writing back saying, don't you understand how these things are related? This is the most important work of my life. This is how it's all connected. 
And so they try multiple times to put their bodies on the line to stop the test, and eventually the French do test their nuclear weapon in February 1960. But I don't look at it as a failure because protests break out all over the continent. And not just that, Nkrumah follows up with the World Without the Bomb conference and other conferences and meetings after this, so it stays on their radar. And of course, I can't talk to you guys about black anti-nuclear activism without looking at Dr. King. Here we are on the cusp of celebrating or commemorating the 50th anniversary of his death. Also the 49th anniversary of his Beyond Vietnam speech at Riverside Church, a year to the day he died, right? April 4th, 1967. And so we're starting more and more to look at that most radical year of his life, when actually he was moving ever closer to Malcolm's train of thought, when he was clearly looking, and it's an economic philosophy of democratic socialism, when he was standing side by side with sanitation workers and was looking at how bad the North was compared to the South, criticizing foreign policy, Vietnam, but also nuclear weapons with its triple evils. And so we look at Dr. King, and we look at when he gets involved in foreign policy, we tend to look at that Riverside Church speech beyond Vietnam as the moment. But if you start looking at nuclear weapons specifically, you'll see that Dr. King was actually speaking out against this issue 10 years earlier, as early as 1957. That's when he made his first public comments about nuclear weapons. And he continues this, whether he's speaking at Spelman, black churches, doing interviews with Ebony, over and over again he's talking about it's either coexistence or co-annihilation. He talks about where the money should be better spent in black communities. He says, what does it matter if we're worrying about integrating lunch counters and then not concerned about the world in which we're trying to integrate? It's ludicrous. And where was Dr. King learning this? From his wife, of course. Coretta was a long seasoned activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. She had been involved in Women's Strike for Peace and Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. But Coretta, like so many other black women that were involved in this movement, were facing prejudice and internal racism within these organizations. There was a meeting in Detroit with Women's Strike for Peace where the black members wanted to have signs that said uh, desegregation or disintegration. And the white members said, absolutely not. Race isn't part of this. Many times it was Coretta who had to broker the deal and try to make the peace through all of this. And we see this over and over with black women fighting inside these, these organizations, something that we still have to deal with and don't want to talk about much today. But not just her. Um, Lorraine Hansberry. Lorraine Hansberry is known for, of course, the Raisin in the Sun. There's so much more to her than that. She was a militant, feminist, socialist activist, and she was against the bomb. She famously went and sees a film on Hiroshima and comes out of the movie theater saying, no more Hiroshima's, not now, not ever. The last place she wrote before she died was about the nuclear holocaust and what happened to the survivors. So we want to put these people in these nice, neat categorical boxes and limit them. But it's not true. There's so much more to them. They realize how these things were connected. Throughout the Vietnam War, we threatened to use nuclear weapons over and over. Even if you look at the Black Panther Party for self-defense, if you read it, the Black Panther Party's executive mandate number one, the first public statement that Bobby Seale, the chairman, read in Sacramento at the Capitol, it clearly connects the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to what the Black Panther Party was fighting for. And I asked Bobby, was this intentional? He said, of course it was. We always looked at ourselves in an international context, which is why Kathleen Cleaver and Eldridge were in Japan and had spoken there and were asked to be there and so on. In the 1970s, when so many people were exhausted and had PTSD and went through hell throughout the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, this issue remained. In the 1970s, there was what was known as the Continental Walk for Nuclear Disarmament. It's supposed to be largely symbolic, people coming from all various parts of the country meeting in D.C. against nuclear weapons. And it largely was, except if you were black and in the South. Because if you were coming up black in the South in there, the police weren't protecting you and they were harassed, and there were death threats. So it wasn't just an exercise for these members. And Jimmy Carter's UN ambassador was none other than Andy Young, right? Dr. King's right-hand man through the civil rights movement. It was Andy Young who talked to President Carter about not going forward and building the neutron bomb. 
It was Andy Young who wanted more pressure on South Africa and to be involved in, these, in the U.S. to be involved in these things. And of course, this is all really coming to a head in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan comes into power. I still, every time I go to Reagan National Airport, refuse. I don't know anybody in D.C. that calls it Reagan National Airport. It's DCA. We refuse to call it Reagan National Airport. And Reagan comes into office, and what does he do? He immediately announces he's going to increase nuclear weapon spending, military spending, $180 billion. At the same time, he decreases spending for social needs by $140 billion. And so a new movement is created, a movement looking at how money could be better spent in poor communities, in the black community, looking at human needs. You see the freeze movement now coming into play. So all of this is happening in the 1980s. And you see it coming in so many different places. You know, I'm so glad now that we have, we're seeing a socially conscious athlete come forward again. You know, not just Michael Bennett, but you know, I taught in Florida, I taught in the same town that Trevon Martin was murdered. And I taught down there when he was murdered, and it was so refreshing to see LeBron throw his hood up before any publicist told him to do it. And so we're seeing now more socially conscious athletes like Kaepernick. And when we talk about this history, we often look at Muhammad Ali, we often look at the 68 Olympics with Tommy Smith and John Carlos, of course. But there was another group of athletes that were also activists. And they were athletes united for peace in the 1980s. And there were black and white athletes working with Russian athletes trying to stop nuclear weapons, trying to get disarmament. People like Jojo, uh, Jojo Washington, or Jojo Young, who, who white, excuse me, who was the basketball player for the Boston Celtics. Uh, Marianne Washington, the first African-American female to play on the U.S. national basketball team. The entire Baltimore Orioles in the 80s went to Hiroshima to meet with survivors to talk about this. You know, when I was doing this research, and I often write for Huffington Post and other publications, and I got a phone call from a gentleman who said, I need to meet with you right away about all this. I said, okay. And so we met, and it's an ordinary fellow, and his name was uh, Greg Johnson. It's in the book. And at the time, his wife was Brenda Johnson in the 80s. He said, at the time, I was a librarian at Georgetown, African Americans. And he said, we care deeply about this issue, but every time we reached out to the white community and to these pacifist groups, nobody bothered with us. And so with a rotary phone and one flyer, they started the group Blacks Against Nukes. Grudo, multiple chapters, hundreds of members, featured in black publications, asked to speak in Hiroshima. Two ordinary people doing something pretty extraordinary. And in the 80s, this is really all leading to the June 12, 1982 rally in Central Park. One million people. No cell phones. No internet. No text messages. And you got one million people in Central Park against nuclear weapons. It's extraordinary. And actually, it's what my, the book I'm writing now is all about, is examining that rally, that march, and how they did it. And when you look at that, talk about intersectionality, there was real debate. And should we combine other issues? Lebanon, El Salvador, Nicaragua, or should it only be about nuclear weapons? And one issue was race. There were a lot of people that didn't want to combine the issue of racism in this and how money could be better spent in black communities. But the Reverend Herbert Daughtry, amazing gentleman who's still kicking today, he's in his 90s in New York, still fighting the fight. He forms the Black United Front. You had the Third World People's Coalition. You had all these non-white voices coming to the table saying, no, we are invested in this. And it takes people like everybody from Ron Dellums to Shaka Khan to Gil Scott Huron and so many others to broker the peace, Avi Davis, Ruby D. And so that day, 50% of the leadership was African American. Coretta Scott King on the stage, Rita Marley performing, thousands of African Americans pouring out of bed in Harlem, all marching in New York against nuclear weapons. And you know, I, the hardest part for me in writing this book, and I have to talk a moment about President Obama. This was clearly the hardest part for me because President Obama was still in office when I was writing the book. And as a historian, the worst thing I can do is be to predict something, be wrong, and then it's out there. Right? But I knew I had to address it. President Obama was at the June 12th rally as a young student, as a reporter, wrote about it. As a college student at Columbia, he wrote papers on nuclear disarmament and the nuclear arms race. So this was always on his radar. 
He certainly spoke out against nuclear weapons as a candidate. And then when he got in office, a few months later, he gave what's now known as the famous Prague speech. Arguably the most anti-nuclear speech any president in U.S. history has given, with the possible exception of John Kennedy's commencement address at American University in June of 1963, known as the Peace Speech. And as when I was director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University, from 2009 up until uh, just last year, I went to Japan, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, take students from around the country every year. Um, and we would partner with Ritz and Macon University, so we would have students from Japan and students from the U.S. together um, for the two weeks during all the ceremonies. And I remember going the year after the Prague speech that summer and how different it was. It was the first time that we ever had a U.S. ambassador at the Hiroshima ceremony, Ambassador Roos, um, President Obama sent him. And as I was walking around the Peace Park on August 6th that morning, Japanese citizens were coming up to me and they were handing me stacks of letters just because I was American saying, send these to your president and thank him for what he's doing. Mayor Akiba in Hiroshima started a campaign called the Obama Majority Campaign. So I was watching all these Japanese citizens wear Obama Majority t-shirts. It was the first time in all the years I had gone to Hiroshima that I was actually proud of who my president was. And he continued on this path at first. He has his nuclear security summits to try to get loose nuclear weapons materials safe, uh, in which case he got materials enough to make four nuclear weapons out of the Ukraine just months before it fell into chaos. He gets the New START treaty passed and signed. I think the most important thing he did as president was without firing a shot, got the Iran nuclear deal done. And while, yes, it was maybe symbolic, um, I will never personally forget being up at 3 o'clock in the morning and Skyping with Hiroshima survivors as they were crying and I was crying as my president was in Hiroshima visiting for the first time and hugging other Habaksha. Does that mean he did everything I wanted? Of course not. He signed on for the $1.2 trillion modernization plan that I obviously opposed. He should have taken nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert before he left. I certainly would have liked to see him reduce nuclear weapons uh, more by, by the time he left, not go forward with subcritical nuclear tests. So, no, he didn't do everything I wanted. But I don't put that on him. I put that on us. Because he never said, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. And if we want him to do something, then we should have pushed him to do it more. And he understood that. He was asked back in 2008 in a campaign uh, debate, would Dr. King be supporting you right now? He said, no. Dr. King would be in the street making me and forcing me to do what I said I was going to do. He understood it. So I put that a lot on us. So now what? What can we learn from all this? You know, as somebody that fought and has fought so many years in my life to eliminate racism and eliminate nuclear weapons, and now to have a white supremacist in the White House and sole control of our nuclear weapons, it's very easy for me to feel like I failed. And I failed the younger generation. But I also made a promise to the Habaksha that I've gotten to know so well over the years that I would never stop fighting for this issue. And they are scared because their average age is over 80. They are dying and they are petrified that when they go, nobody's going to pass on their story and try to stop this. Trump, it's even more important now, considering he has the sole authority to use nuclear weapons, as many of you know. It would only take 32 warheads to decimate North Korea, 90 to take out Iran, 147 to completely destroy Russia. And there's literally nothing anybody can do to stop him. We are really the only fail-safe left. And if you want to look at the juxtaposition, if you want to look at how race intersects with nuclear weapons, it can't be any clearer than today. I mean, Trump, first of all, his cabinet is a dream team of white supremacists. From Jeff Sessions, he used to have Bannon. Now he just puts in John Bolton, who wants to get rid of the Iran nuclear deal, wants to go to war with North Korea. Rick Perry. Trump got the coveted Ku Klux Klan endorsement. When you look at what he says about people of color and nuclear weapons, he says that Saudi Arabia should build their own arsenal, that Japan should have their own arsenal, that we should use them on North Korea, that South Korea should have them. He's talked about starting up nuclear testing again, which we know what that does to people of color around the world and in our own country. He has, his economic plan has been called Reaganomics on steroids. 
is promised a $1.2 trillion modernization plan. I mean, today, in this dystopian nightmare, he sat on the balcony of the White House with the Easter Bunny bragging about giving $700 billion more dollars to the military for spending. And so what do you have? On one end, you have ICANN winning a Nobel Peace Prize. You have over 100 nations, mostly non-white, signing on to ban nuclear weapons in the United Nations. And on the other side, you have Putin and Trump, two white nationalist authoritarians with 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. Can't be any clearer when we look at how race is involved in this. And so we can learn from this history. We can learn from what they did well in the freeze movement and in the 1980s and how we can adapt that to today. Because one issue that they always did was focus on the human element in the 1980s, those like Helen Caldicott. See how these things were intersected. We can learn from today. I have been to so many rallies and so many protests in my day, and I, I can tell you that I have never in my life been to one more well-organized than the Parkland one in DC that I was just at with my students. It was incredible. Not just in how well organized it was, but how they were able to keep gun violence as the main issue and yet still intersect so many other issues throughout the whole thing. It was flawless. And I'm so impressed by them. You know, I can't have stated we need to create a transnational community on this issue. But the thing with us, and especially the young kids that I meet with today, is we want instant gratification. It's hard to explain to them that in this country it's, it's, a, it's a bore, it's a slog, it's a grind. We don't have these revolutions where we storm the White House and the leader flees in exile and topple the government. We don't have that here. And so we have to start getting to think about beyond the present moment. I know that nuclear weapons are probably going to still be here and so will racism when I die. But if it's a little bit less for my students, for my young niece, for my future children, then that's all I can do. That's all any of us can do. The great writer Rebecca Silnet says, the true impact of activism may not be felt for a generation. That alone is reason to fight rather than surrender in despair. Trump does not want us to have hope. That's why we feel beaten down every single day when we read the news. Because if we don't have hope, then we won't act. He wants these young kids to feel powerless. But hope is the biggest way to resist. But hope is only the beginning. Hope is not a substitute for action. It's the basis for it. And so we need to find hope in who came before us. You know, when I researched this book, the thing that struck me so much was seeing so many individuals that were in their own abyss, in their own misery, trying to gain racial equality, and yet wield their collective power for a world without nuclear weapons. It was incredible. You know, King often said that the moral arc is long, but it bends towards justice. I would add, not unless we bend it. So, yes, we need to fight every day for our undocumented brothers and sisters and students. Yes, we need to fight for the LGBTQ community and so that women are treated equal in this country. And of course, so that black lives matter. But as Dr. King said, what does it matter if we finally achieve social justice in this world if we're all dead from nuclear war? And when we start to look at this the way so many before us did, and perhaps Malcolm X who understood it best, then we'll start to realize that the issue has never been about civil rights. It was, is, and remains universal human rights. Thank you. Uh, questions, you can line up on either side of the room, whichever is easiest for you to access. 
Um, please be respectful of everyone's time tonight by keeping your questions concise and to the point. Um, and please, no questions that are actually statements or personal stories. We will have a lot of time after the program for mingling and questions with the speakers and other activists, so you can save your statements for then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so go ahead and come on down for questions, and we'll use these mics here. My name is Aditya. Uh, my question is <clears throat> why you are focusing specifically on the nuclear bomb. Uh, I know that in uh, Japan, uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki occurred three days after um, 157,000 tons of uh, fire bombs um, killed actually more than the total Absolutely. of people killed mm -hmm. by nuclear bombs. Yeah, great point. Um, of course, we know with uh, the firebombing campaign that 80,000 people were killed in Tokyo alone, white phosphorus and napalm and Curtis LeMay's uh, whole bombing campaign. In fact, before the bomb was ever dropped, Secretary of War Stimson told Truman that if we don't stop, uh, in the number of we're going to outdo Hitler in the number of atrocities. So no question about that. Uh, the difference for me is it's not the same as any other bomb. To me, I look at two things that can eliminate us as a species right now, nuclear war and climate change. Uh, and so when you look at this, it's to me, you know, again, when, when I hear students see uh, or anybody say that a, there's a storm and they're like, oh, it looked like a nuclear weapon went off. No, it didn't. Um, so knowing that how instantly what it can do and then over the long term what it can do and now you look at the economic pieces of it I mean there's just so many layers to it that is just completely different from any other weapon and again this narrative that's just another weapon of war has never held up um, we hear that that's you know Truman didn't know how powerful it was nonsense Truman is told uh, the first day he's in office he is told by by uh, Jimmy Burns and by Stimson that they're building a new weapon and that it's great enough to completely end civilization he has told that multiple times so he knows that this bomb can end the world and yet he puts this process in place anyway so that we're all now running around with this kind of fear. So I, I do look at it um, as a completely separate thing from just conventional bombing, so. And that's not to say I'm in favor of conventional bombing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just preface that, right? Not to say I'm justifying that or drones or any of these things, but I, see, I do see this as, as somewhat s separate and different in that regard. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I'm Carl. So I, I walked in here a, an advocate of nuclear energy. Uh, and to be respectful, I, I don't think that that's changed, but I do recognize that nuclear energy is in some way non-trivially colonial. Now, the question is, how do we diffuse the colonialism of energy itself when Africa and South America are, are hungry for energy and we need them to reach our standard of living in order to fight population growth? Yeah. Uh let me know if you got the answer, because I certainly don't. But um, <laughs> I mean, the issue of nuclear energy, uh, obviously, you can look at the colonialism issue from where you're getting the materials. Um, and I don't have an easy fix on that. I do somewhat separate those two things, though, right? Uh, so I was in Hiroshima as well during the year of Fukushima. And talked to a lot of the survivors about that and how they looked at the bomb as being somewhat different from that. I know it's some combined all the nuclear power issue in one shot. And I certainly understand the rationale as well on that. So um, I, I am not in favor of, of turning just solely to nuclear, even though it can be cleaner and cheaper and so on and so forth, um, because there's too many accidents and too much you know, hell can happen. Um, but I, do, I, I don't necessarily put it in this. I just don't lump it all together with nuclear weapons. I do see them as different. And that's just from, again, speaking with so many Habakshi and what they feel of it and their education to me and how they view the whole thing. Um, but in terms of nuclear colonialism, I mean, it's, it's when you look at, I mean, God, you guys are, of course, in the mecca of it, right? From Hanford to Boeing, I mean, you're, you're in it. So when you look at whether it's nuclear testing or what we're doing with, with nuclear waste or what we're doing with uranium mining, it's, it all, you know, obviously just reeks of colonialism. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's all got to go, obviously, but, I'm, you know, we got to, there's not one silver bullet to do it, so. Thank you for your talk, thank you. I'm a physician who studies the human condition and war has been a part of it. I was conceived the night Pearl Harbor in the United States by Madden and went through the Vietnam.
Vietnam, my choices were to leave the country or go to prison for seven years. So I studied war. How do you feel? My research has revealed that the cause of war occurs very early in, in childhood. If you look at histories of men like Stalin, history and um, uh, Hitler, they had fathers who tried to kill them. I hold the, the, the theory that war is started as a child, and it's a way that we exhibit our anger and hurt and all those things. How do you relate to that, please? Um, I, again, I don't think anything is, I, I'm not, I haven't studied um, psychology to say that I know the, if this is, if there, how much research and definitive proof is there on this. I would say that I don't, again, think anything is to monolithic and to say that every single person's views on wars are developed as a child. It does make me think, though, of how, at least in the United States, how our culture cultivates this as young children, right? So, you know, if you look at the, the World War II, um, you know, in that 19, in the Cold War, you had so much of that John Wayne mentality, right? That victory culture, um, that this was what it meant to be a man, right? That women were supposed to go to work and men were supposed to do this and you went under, and, and this was that, this is what the Vietnam generation, this is their parents were, right? So you had those that were taught that to be a man, you were gonna go and fight, right? There was this, all this hyper-masculinity. Uh, if you look even at the films, and then of course in the 1980s, what do you have? You have Rambo and you have Chuck Norris and it's the same repeat, right? You go into, then now you have what? Chris Kyle and you have American Sniper and you have all, it's the same mentality over and over again. Um, and so I don't know, how, obviously I would think that would affect you growing up in your decision making, whether you, you know, someone volunteered to go in or not, you know, because I look at it differently. My father was in the service and he absolutely hated it. And I grew up in a household that did not have uh, these gender stereotypes. So I came in a working class union household. My father, I remember, washed dishes with my mother. He did laundry with my mother. So it was never giving me my beer and my woman, you know, it wasn't that kind of a household. So therefore, growing up, I was not in favor of ever going in the military or serving. I was anti-war my whole life. I um, married a feminist. Like, I mean, these are because of your upbringing. So I do think it plays a role how much I don't know. But thank you. Thank you, Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you correctly told us that in two days' time, we're coming to the 50th anniversary of murder of Martin Luther King, mm. 51st anniversary of the Riverside speech mm. address. Are you aware that there was a trial in the murder of Martin Luther King? And since you are then, could you tell us, please, what the verdict was? You're talking about the FBI's involvement in... No. Oh, I'm talking about the trial in Memphis, Tennessee in 1999, where there was a trial for three and a half weeks, 70 witnesses, the verdict of six blacks and six whites came back within an hour or two that there was a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King right. involving governmental agencies. Yes, that's what I meant. Yes, that's, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I think you pretty much covered it, um, so I thank you, but it's, I think it's pretty well known, at, you know, again, at, at this point that the government had knowledge and was involved in, in to a degree of, of the murder of Dr. King. So, um, yeah, and even, even before that day, we know that there were multiple attempts on his life that the government knew about. There would be bomb threats that were coming in for his planes and things like that they purposely didn't tell him about. So, you know, this was obviously routine. Um, so, yeah, I think that this isn't, this is obviously something that, but again, the thing with, to focus on with King is not just the government's role in killing him, or, um, but it's again how we like to preserve him on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and just kind of box him in, right? Um, I, I think we need to look at the, also the, not to go too off topic, but the humanization of these people too. I think we are so, we love to put these people on pedestals. Um, King was a human being. Right? And that's everything from plagiarizing speeches to smoking to his relationship with his wife to using the N-word in private. That doesn't change anything he did. It made him us. It made him a human being, a flawed human being, right? I mean, you could just say the same thing about Malcolm. But when we elevate these people into sainthood, then we can never be them. Our kids can never be them. So I think it's important that we take a step back and realize you know, just who they were. I tell kids all the time, they look at me and all the activism and, I, and, and marching and King and all this, and I say, you know what King did 90% of his time? He was in a church basement having discussions and meetings. That's what activism was. 1% was out him marching, but people don't realize the, you know, what he was doing all these times. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's, there's been multiple books written about this and documents out there on this, and obviously do your own thinking, your own research, but um, yeah, I think there's still a lot that we can learn on Dr. King. Hi, um, 
I have to see the resistance and revolutions, and I'm not arguing with what you're saying. They try to destroy something, but there also needs to be a positive vision and a way to inspire people that don't agree with you to think about that. How would you describe that for this movement? Yeah, so I, again, this is what I've been asking folks um, when I'm writing this book on the 1980s. Like, how did you do it, right? And so their thing was, you know, they got people in middle America. They got people that disagreed with them. They were reaching out to different churches. And so, um, again, it was, they had to decide. This was not easy fights of how did they decide how militant they were going to be or was it going to be a single issue or any of these things. And so, to me, this, again, really shouldn't be a partisan issue. Um, but I don't know, like, going in, when I talk to religious groups, I don't know how you call yourself pro-life and then you're okay with nuclear weapons. That, to me, just seems like an oxymoron, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, going to cancer walks and marathons and explaining here's how nuclear weapons and radiation affects cancer victims, right? Um, so just thinking outside the box of all these different groups and how you can work together with these things. Um, you know, again, it's here being kind of, again, in the, in the middle of all this, uh, with Hanford, you know, Hanford, it strikes me when you have this, this now that's a memorial or a national park, um, but you're only seeing one view of it. It's very much like the Enola Gay controversy in 1995. There needs to be two sides. We need to make sure that we are explaining what the plutonium did in Nagasaki um, and let people decide for themselves. Um, so I think we need to think about how we're going to reach out to all different, if you could get people from Boeing to come out against this, which I know isn't easy because when I was speaking in Syracuse, New York, I was having the same kind of conversation. People were saying, we're, we agree with you, but we work for Lockheed Martin. And to us, it's just a job. We're not in favor of nuclear weapons, but find me another job. And I suspect you would get some of that with Boeing employees. I'm not sure how much they're locked in on the nuclear stuff. But um, so you just got to think of how you're going to reach out to different folks. I mean, I think, too, is that it's an education. We don't study peace enough in this country. Um, you know, there's, we love celebrating war in this country. We're really good at celebrating war. Peace, not so much. We have one peace museum in this country. It's in Dayton, Ohio. It's a quarter of the size of this room. Um, again, you go to Washington, D.C., you see the names of 58,000 men on that wall for Vietnam. Nowhere, and I mean nowhere in the United States, is there anything that talks about the 3.8 million Vietnamese that we killed. If those names were put on the wall, that wall would be nine miles long. And then maybe people would think a little bit differently, regardless of their political stance on how we look at war. And I tell my kids all the time right now, why aren't you out there trying to stop war in Afghanistan and these things? Well, it's a million miles away. We grew up with it. And I say, well, what if we have a war tomorrow and there's a draft where you got to go to North Korea? Hell no, I won't go. Burning the draft card. You know? And so it's also getting people to realize they need to think beyond themselves. And I tell people all the time, I'm... Actually, I'm the safest person right now uh, with the Trump administration. I'm a white male, right? Um, but it's all the people that I don't know. It's my wife who's Puerto Rican. It's my niece who's black. It's students that I have of color. It's all so many people I don't know that you have to think about. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we need, to, we need to branch out on that. And I think, you know, especially on this issue, there is a segment of the left that is incredibly frustrating. And I'm as progressive and left as they come. But, man, there are some of these groups that are such a purity test that if you're not down with the... Who in Jill Stein coalition, then forget you. Uh, or if you're using social media and you're young, well, then you're not really, you didn't pass the test. And those days are over. Like, it can't, you can't do that. You've got to start thinking uh, about how we're going to reach other, other constituencies on this. It's just there's, there's too much at stake right now. Um, so sorry for the long answer, but. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not going anywhere. I'll get you in here. Go ahead. So you talked about hope. Uh, and you know, it still has to be there despite the fact that we have um, the likelihood that we have two, the two greatest threats to the life on this earth planet, um, <coughs> nuclear weapons, which I think is the 12th greatest threat, and uh, climate change. So I was wondering, you know, you studied a lot of history, you really looked into all these things and what, what, how, how do you think the chances are that we're going to have a civilization uh, as we know it 200 years from now? Hmm. Again, as a historian, the worst thing I can do is predict, and God knows you can't predict with this president, right? Um, it's hard to have hope. Of course it is. I mean, you, I tell my students to be engaged, to read the Washington Post, New York Times before they come into my classes every day. And 
I don't want to read the Washington Post, New York Times every morning when I get up, right? I mean, we are dealing with such trauma and such so at such a rapid clip that every day it feels like you're punched in the gut. So how do you, you know, tell them to have hope? So it is difficult. And then you have that, you know, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moving their clock. You see how close we are to nuclear war, and it's it's just it's easy to just kind of hunker down, divorce yourself from it. But you can't, and I don't know what's going to happen, you know, when we're long gone. But what I do know is that, you know, when I teach my course on slavery, David Walker and Nat Turner and John Brown and Denmark Vesey, they didn't ever think that there was going to be freedom. And it didn't happen necessarily in their lifetime, but it happened. You know, we see all these teachers striking today. Well, the reason we got a weekend, the reason we got an eight-hour workday is because people like Emma Goldman and people, the women that were dying at Triangle Shirtwaist and, so many nameless, faceless Chinese immigrants building the railroad that we don't ever learn their names in the history books, but they did it generations later, but they did it. You know, and even in contemporary times, look at ICANN. 10 years, younger kids under 30 work. They got a nuclear, a legally binding ban on nuclear weapons at the United Nations. That's incredible. Um, they did it. And, you know, is it going to ban nuclear weapons today? No, okay, but look at what, what the chemical weapons ban and, the, and, the, and mining and ban on mines have done over time. Hopefully it will shame and it will lead that process till we get less and less and less. And that's all you can do is just keep chipping away at it slowly and just, you just keep working at it and hope. That's all, that's all you can do. Because if you don't have that, you know, then why bother? What, what are we doing here then, right? So um, I wish I could tell you, you know, 200 years we're going to be all set, but... You know, I can't, I can't, can't say that for, for sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry, she was waiting here and then I'll get you in. Sorry, yes, go ahead. I will take any answer you can provide. <laughs> okay. I've, I've been an anti-nuclear activist for over a decade now and uh, the disarmament community has an old white dude problem, no offense, uh, but I'm a white activist. How can I help solve that problem? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, and you're absolutely right. Uh, first of all, Understand there's a difference between nuclear disarmament community and arms control community. Two different things. Um, the arms control community, they don't want to completely get rid of nuclear weapons. They want arms control, right? Some of them are getting paid really good money and job in DC, and so they don't want to see this go away. Um, and then there's the disarmament community. But yes, we have far too many groups that are run by white males. Um, there is an absolute patriarchy and race problem. There's dysfunction. Uh, I look at, in many ways, the disarmament community, much like the climate change community was about a decade ago, where they were a mess. But what they figured out is they needed one thing to kind of rally behind and, and get behind, and of course it was Keystone. Keystone wasn't the be-all, end-all of environmentalism, but they knew it was tangible. If they could win that fight, it would be something you could move forward. Um, and I think people were working on that before he got elected. They were saying, okay, what are we going to ask Hillary for ICBM to eliminate that or whatever, and this happened. To get back to how, what you can do is, first of all, just show up. And what I mean is, you know, there's this thing where you show up to a Black Lives Matter rally or a rally for Dreamers or Standing Rock, but it's like, hey, I'm here for nuclear disarmament. I'm going to tell you what we need to do. And no, just show up. And it's going to take a long time to build that trust in those relationships. Don't be an ally, be an accomplice. Be more than that. And eventually they're going to say, man, here she is. She keeps showing up. She's still with us. So that when you say, now I need you, I need you, you got to catch my back now. I'm doing a disarmament rally. They're going to show up for you. Um, and you start explaining how these things, you know, in Baltimore, right where near I live, I'm in DC, this winter, they didn't have heat in their classrooms in many of the schools. They were actually asking parents to send space heaters for their kids. Well, if you can go to those parents and say, okay, we're going to spend $1.2 trillion on nuclear weapons. We got enough to end civilization. Oh, by the way, there's no heat in your classrooms. Start making those connections. And I know economic conversion doesn't technically work that easy, but you start getting them to buy in and understand how it directly affects them, right? So um, there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, look at how you can reach diverse groups and just younger kids in general. There's a real branding problem. Um, you know, you talk to these young kids about, Black Lives Matter or about gun violence, it's cool, they're in, they're wearing the swag, they're, they're, they buy in. You talk about peace issues, oh, that's, that's, that's just old white hippies, that's Pete Seeger, that's peace doves, no, 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 no. So you gotta think and say, all right, how do we get younger folks to really think about this in a different way? And, and so there's a lot of that that we need to look at, but step one is just showing up. Yes, you had your hand up. Did you see the Black Panther? Of course I did. <laughs> I absolutely love Black Panther. Um, 
<laughs> uh, of course. And I, you know, um, I didn't want to go crazy over analyzing it, you know, but um, of course I knew my students were all going to ask me about it when it came out. And I just think there's so many wonderful things. I think about my niece, who my niece is African American, and she loves science. And I just think of what she thought of when she saw the sister. I thought the sister was the best character in it. I can't wait for that sister to meet Tony Stark and have so much more technology than than white Tony Stark has. Um, I love that they that that the director actually used uh, the women for the the Dahomey people. I love that they had futuristic stuff in an uncolonized place, but also still used traditional weapons, but just made them futuristic. I mean, there was so many things like that that he threw in there. I love that they refer to the white guy through the whole thing as the colonizer. I love, um, you know, I love that people had to grapple with Killmonger and how they were like, man, I kind of agree with some of what he's saying, but not really his methods. What does that mean? I had students asking if Killmonger was supposed to be Malcolm and and uh, Black Panther was Martin and how that was wrong. And like, so we just, I think it's it was wonderful um, for obviously for black students, but for everybody to really to really watch it. And I love like when there were white, well, you know, like I had a, I actually had a white supremacist in one of my classes, and when he was like, well, um, where's the White Panther? I'm like, it's called Thor. You've had him over and over again. Like, come on. So, um, but yeah, so I loved it. I loved it. And I think he's just a great director. I mean, if you look at what he's done, Fruitvale Station was absolutely phenomenal. Creed was great, and now he has this one. So he's on a roll uh, as far as films go. He's, he's, he's great. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, in this area, we had uh, Archbishop Hunthausen, the Catholic bishop back in the 80s, who called uh, our local uh, Navy sub base the Auschwitz of Puget Sound. Mm. And he said, instead of throwing people in the gas chambers, now we're throwing the gas chambers at the people. And he got in trouble with Reagan and the Pope, actually, mm. in a uh, effort to fight against communism, and that's why he was mm. basically kicked out. But I just wondered for our uh, leaders of faith and any particular ones that in the Catholic Church we're not seeing a lot of great uh, forceful speaking like that, but other faith leaders or that kind of part of society that you can point us to or other... Well, I mean, I, I do think that you see it with this This Pope has made statements. I think Pax Christi has done some great work. Um, you know, you need to look back at people like Sister Megan Rice and what they were willing to do. You look at um, leaders in the Buddhist community. I think there's 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 leaders that are out there um, that certainly have taken up this mantle. But again, like politicians, we need to push them, you know? Um, one thing I didn't mention is, and I learned this today, that your politicians here, your U.S. senators, um, are not backing the Marky Lou bill? They're not backing this? That's, un that's ridiculous, especially where you live. This should be something that's front and center that we are going after. Um, the Marky Lou bill is, to, is a bill in Congress to prevent Trump from, uh, strike, from using first strike nuclear weapons. Essentially, he would have to get congressional approval before he launches. And uh, I was shocked to find that out. And because especially when you look at the history of politicians, you know, I didn't mention this, but way before President Obama. I mean, Jesse Jackson ran for president in 84 and 88. And if you look at his platform, it was the most progressive uh, in terms of nuclear weapons than any other Democratic candidate. You had people like the Congressional Black Caucus for a long time was at the forefront of this, not just John Conyers, but Ron Dellums. I mean, Ron Dellums, he was the leader in fighting Reagan to stop the MX missile program. He goes to Utah and meets with Spencer Kimball, the head of the Mormon church, to get him to come out publicly, speaking of faith, to say, no, we're not building it here. So um, I think, too, beyond just faith leaders is focusing on your politicians and just holding them to the fire, bird dogging them and, you know, making them making it known that they need to get on board with this stuff. <laughs> can I write it on the board? Um, can you, okay, cool. Yes, sir. Yes. I was told I can't tell stories. So I'm going to ask you to tell one. Okay. Um, the story of A. Philip Randolph in 1941. You mean the first yeah, march? Yeah, the, the first march. And what can we get from that? From how he um, used that to create a movement out of seemingly nothing? Yeah, I mean, so the, kind of the original march on Washington idea was to protest and have a, a mass march. Um, to get more African Americans and getting jobs in, in the war industry and so on and so forth. And that leads later. I mean, the thing with Randolph uh, is not only, he, of course, he was a great organizer, sleeping car porters. Um, but on this issue, Randolph was kind of all over the place. 
um, when you talk about nuclear weapons, when I looked at the research, at first Randolph was not in favor of this. Randolph was very much like, hey, we need to work on civil rights, nuclear weapons isn't part of this. But as Sane and other groups start coming along, he starts lending his name to this stuff. He starts saying, okay, we need to look back at that march and what we can do now on nuclear weapons. So he kind of is wishy-washy and goes back and forth on this throughout his career. Um, but, you know, again, when we look at even the, the 63 March on Washington and what his role in is that, I mean, people forget, and I'm glad you mentioned it, that there was this previous march that was really the catalyst for, for what we now know as the March on Washington. Um, go ahead, sir. I'll get you in here. I have a question for you, and it's, uh, I'm phrasing it as a question. Okay. Do you know of any people of color, African Americans or otherwise, who worked on the Manhattan Project uh, either at the mm -hmm. engineering district in New yep. Mexico or any other groups, Fermi Group in Chicago, Columbia University, yes. and other areas. If not, uh, first of all, it may be a good research question to try and tackle that, if not for you, then for students at this university as well. And otherwise, if there are none, then I am almost sure that today, with the current move to modernization, which essentially means new weapons, nuclear weapons mm -hmm. of a completely different mm -hmm. design, there must be, I think, people of color who would be working on those projects. Mm -hmm. And if that could be documented and uh, conducted as an oral history, perhaps there could be some positive outcome about that. Yeah, great question. Um, so not that I... Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that didn't make it in the books. When you publish for an academic press, they want shorter books. So. I had to lump about 200 pages off of this book. And that includes some of the stuff that I did on um, the scientists, the black scientists and mathematicians that were working on the Manhattan Project, also black atomic veterans that were then used in the 1950s as guinea pigs when we tested on them, uh, the South Africa and dismantling their program. Um, so a lot of this, that the Savannah River Project and all the racism that went on through there and environmental racism. But to get back to your question, what I found was when I started looking up black scientists and those that were working on the Manhattan Project is, in the black community, there was an effort to celebrate them, but not the bomb, right? So what they were doing is they were coming out and saying, so-and-so was this great mathematician, so-and-so was this great scientist, as if to say, look, we're smart enough, we're smart as whites, we're work we can show we can work side by side with whites, but they were holding praise for them, the personal people than they were the bombs to try again as a way to gain civil rights. There was also African Americans that were involved and they were being trusted to keep secrets with the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and again, you would, I would find articles where they were writing saying, see, the government is trusting African Americans for this, we should then get equality. So yes, um, there's plenty that you could find in the black press and their names and who they were and that they were working on all of these places, they absolutely were. Um, but again, what I found stunning was kind of the giant headlines of black scientists worked on the bomb and then when I would further read, they were very careful to not praise the bomb, but praise the actual scientist. So yes, it's out there. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. There's actually a school here in Washington State that I attended, um, Richland High, and their mascot actually is the atomic bomb. I heard so this today. I was actually curious, like, how do you address like, a mascot change or something like that? Yeah, I heard that today, and I was just yeah. completely taken aback. I and I mean, um, but I mean. <laughs> Well, let's put, it in pers let's put it in perspective. I'm in the Washington Redskins area, so I mean, you know, we see that fight going on. So obviously, uh, students and faculty, right? I mean, um, if students, uh, especially the athletes, are saying, you know what, not going to be any teams then if this is going to be it. You know, understand your power, uh, the power of consumers, the power of boycotting. There's huge power in doing that. The problem is you got to get everybody on board and you got to have the lasting power. And this is something when I'm training students on activism, you know, we talk about Montgomery. Um, you know, Montgomery was 384 days of bus boycott. That means when it's no longer the cool hashtag or the cool bracelet or the cool thing to do, you need to stick with it. And so to get everybody to buy in and say, look at, we are not budging until this mascot is changed, you would have to have that kind of a commitment. And that's the difficult part, the education part that you have to get people to really understand. I mean, I tell students all the time at school, I'm like, what if we were going to boycott the prices in the cafeteria for this horrible food they sell you. I'm like, would you be on in board? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, you wouldn't last one hour without walking by and be like, I'm just going to grab one slice really quick and then be on my way, right? I mean, that's what it takes. So I would say don't underestimate and don't doubt the power that students have in terms of changing that, but you have to get that commitment in. And the first step would be educating. I mean, sure, I'm sure a lot of students don't know why that is offensive. 
right? And they need to understand that. And then again, this is where this research comes in because let's say there's a student that has no history of the bomb, but they really love Malcolm or Martin or Coretta or, you know, somebody like that. The goal is that they would read this and then be like, oh, I didn't realize like Huey Newton cared about nuclear weapons. All right, I'm on board. Let's boycott this. Um, so to try to get them to realize that the very people they look up to actually would be doing that and you could start there. I am um, impressed by, I appreciate the fact that you did not limit your research to the typical well-known heroes, but you really reach out to the quote, uh, regular individuals to really find out how they were involved in the work that they did. My question is, did they tell you, did they share with you at all issues of infiltration by the government as they were doing their activities? Um, no, I didn't come across that, although if you look through the FBI files, you'll see that the FBI was much more concerned, of course, with King talking about this issue and about Vietnam and these things than they were even about him talking about civil rights. Uh, they were clearly much more concerned about Malcolm when he was out of the Nation of Islam, not under the thumb of Elijah Muhammad. Um, but I didn't come across where they were, the government was infiltrating some of these groups. Um, and of course, I'm sure they were, um, these pacifist groups especially. Um, but no, it wasn't something that constantly came up or that was even in interviews or anything like that. All right.